Ladies and gentlemen, students, faculty, trustees, honored guests and friends of Hillsdale College, welcome. I am Mark Kaltoff, Dean of the Faculty, Chairman of the Department of History and Political Science, and it's my honor and privilege to welcome you to this annual Distinguished Fellow Lecture by Sir Martin Gilbert. Hillsdale College celebrates and teaches the roots of the American order, roots grounded in the religious and political culture of the four great cities, Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, and London. Our nation's founding in Philadelphia, however, was particularly indebted to the Western heritage as developed in its British context. Although born in a struggle against Britain, the United States today stands allied together with its mother country. This alliance is a major story of the 20th century. The unity of the English-speaking peoples was responsible for allied victory in world wars. And this unity of English-speaking peoples was in no small way the achievement of the man Winston Churchill. Tonight, we are honored to have with us Winston Churchill's official biographer and the man who has written the book on Churchill in America, Sir Martin Gilbert. After this evening's lecture, we will have a brief time for questions and answers. I would ask that those who have questions after the lecture approach the microphone here to my left and speak their question to the microphone because we are recording this evening's event. Immediately following the question and answer session, books by Sir Martin will be available for sale in the lobby outside, and then the evening will conclude with a special reception and book signing upstairs in conference rooms A and B of the Dow Conference Center. All are welcome to attend. Now, to introduce our speaker, I ask you to please join me in welcoming to the podium the 12th president of Hillsdale College, a man who has for many years been a student of Winston Churchill and who is also a close friend and associate of Sir Martin Gilbert, Dr. Larry P. Arm. Thank you for coming. Uh, so I get, uh, it's probably not right for me to introduce Martin uh, and next year maybe a student should do it so they can have the thrill that I had to do it when I was a student. Uh, I noticed on my calendar this morning I was to do it, so I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity, first by telling a story at the expense of Mark Kaltoff, and then something about Martin Gilbert. So tonight, uh, Professor Kaltoff was over at my house for dinner, and uh, I introduced him to somebody as a big cheese around here. And uh, he said, uh, I've always been big. And I said, yes, but I made you into a cheese. That's my contribution to his career. He's big, isn't he? Um, Martin Gilbert was born and raised in London, except for a period when he was evacuated for safety with a lot of other children to Canada. He went to Maudlin College, uh, one of the Oxford colleges. And he got a first there, which is an important thing. Uh, there was a man in Rodeo Drive, one of my favorite stories years ago. Rodeo Drive is a fancy place to shop in Los Angeles. He sold coins, and he had a plaque up behind his cash register, and he said that he had attained third highest honors in Oxford. And to get a third in Oxford is almost a fail. Uh, <laughs> Martin Gilbert got a first. It's uh, not unique in his family because his son, his youngest son, Josh, two years ago, I guess, got a first. Uh, Martin was knighted, he's Sir Martin, uh, by John Major in 1995 for his service to history. He is, by every account, one of the foremost historians of our time. He has roughly 80 books. If these books were of uh, middling quality and character, they would be a wonderful tale. That is not what they are like, and the distinctive thing about them is not their number, but their quality. I don't mean by quality that they're good for whatever kind of thing they are, 
I mean the term in an objective sense, they are different from almost all academic history books, and they are better than those books that are written today. He doesn't write books about other historians and their views, which is the style today, not the style here, I am proud to boast. But in most colleges of quality, what you do is you do the historiography. You write the story of what someone else wrote and correct it and add your perspective to it and perspective is all. That's um, difficult in a way because there are a lot of history books and you have to master them. But there are not so many history books as there are records of the past. And a harder thing yet is to confront the records of the past. Uh, I happen to know that one of Sir Martin's teachers, a famous man, gave him the advice among three pieces of advice when he graduated that the primary source materials in the period in which Sir Martin has made his career have been exhausted. He writes his books almost entirely from those materials. Uh, my wife and I, I did meet my wife working in his house. Um, it was the best thing that I took from there. But the other thing I took is priceless itself. Um, I remember one year we went down to the University of, De uh, of uh, London where he was giving a series of lectures. And the greatest historians in Britain of the time came to attend, and I remember it was tense. We were all keyed up. He was going to talk to these historians. And a certain one of them, and I'm refraining from naming names because it's not Sir Martin's style to do so, although I confess it is mine. <laughs> I've not learned from him perfectly. But tonight, I'm being good. A certain fellow introduced him by saying that uh, he hoped that Sir Martin would take the uh, microscope from his eye and give the general picture. And uh, this fellow, uh, Martin, stood up and the first words he said was, it stuck to my eye. <laughs> and, the, and the claim against him in those days, he's since, by the way, become an artist. If you, you know, he's written 80 books and I have read most of them. And, it's sort of a career of mine to know about him. But, uh, and, it, and it must be, by the way, because he produces so much. And, and, and he has, in his later years, become an artist, but the method was there in the beginning. And the, the claim against him when he was a much younger man was, um, he's stuck in the details. There's no theme. And this man uh, asked him a question later with all these great historians there. I can name 10 people who are very famous who were in the room. And he said, you know, in my book I have shown Martin. And Martin is the official biographer of Winston Churchill, a prized job having access to these materials that no one can see, they would complain. My book I show, da da da. And uh, Martin responded to him. And I remember he sort of jumped up and there was a spring in his step. It was a really great moment. And he said, you know, you may have shown that, but <laughs> what Churchill wrote about that at the time was the following. And he quoted it. And so perhaps the thing you've said is true, but what is the evidence for it? And all these great people fell back. Now, that sounds important, maybe, but I'll tell you why it's more important than that. I hope and I believe, and I in most cases know, that what you're being taught here is that there is a reality to know. And if you're being taught well, you're learning to think that it is not easy to find. I have gone and spent myself several hundred pounds of this man's money knowing, because I happened to work in his house, I was a young man, like you, I didn't know anything about money back then, that he didn't have very much. And I would uh, spend money getting photocopies of documents so he could tell the whole story. And I never saw him complain about that. Always instead to nag me, did you get everything?
And so if you set out to think that there's a truth to find, it will involve you in the most enormous difficulty. You will have to give your every fiber to the search for it because it is not easy to find. And the easier thing to be would be someone who believes that there's only perspectives to adopt. And the historian alive today, I argue and believe, who disproves that dreary teaching and challenges us to work is the great Sir Martin Gilbert. Thank you very much, Larry. I can't, uh, <clears throat> I can't promise that I will rise to the occasion uh, quite so brilliantly as you portray me. But uh, it's always an honor to be asked to speak here at Hillsdale. Uh, for my wife and I, Hillsdale has become a second home, and it's always a joy to be here. My first task tonight, before I answer the questions that you have set me, is to make an announcement that, to my mind, is to the greatest credit of Hillsdale College and of Dr. Arne. Starting early next year, at six monthly intervals, the Hillsdale College Press will be republishing the complete multi-volume official biography of Sir Winston Churchill. Both the eight narrative volumes the first two by Randolph Churchill, the last six by myself, and the 16 existing document volumes, a work that is already in the Guinness Book of Records as the longest biography in the English language. <laughs> the Hillsdale College Press, um, obviously regarding me as underworked, has also commissioned me to complete the remaining six volumes of Churchill documents covering the years 1942 to 1965, the year of his death. It is especially meaningful for me that I will now be able to complete my life's work, which were it not for Hillsdale College would not have come to pass. Tonight is also a special moment for me as a distinguished fellow of Hillsdale College for the last five years, because it is the the first launching night of my new book, Churchill and America, which had its genesis in a class here at Hillsdale College when I began to develop the theme some four and a half years ago. Churchill and America, the title of my new book, is a theme of endless fascination and instruction. A First World War British colleague said of Churchill, there's a lot of Yankee in Winston. He knows how to hustle and to make others hustle too. And many Americans were attracted to Churchill's personality. One of his secretaries, who worked with him both in the United States and Britain, wrote to her father, unlike most Englishmen, he is naturally at ease among Americans who seem to understand him better than his own countrymen. The question you have set me tonight, I feel in a way you've asked me to sit an examination, is what did the United States mean to Winston Churchill? My answer is that the United States, the great republic as he liked to call it, meant many things to him, and I would like to give you my list, my personal list, of the top 25. First of all, the United States meant to Churchill his mother's land. His mother, Jenny Jerome, was born in Brooklyn. His American grandfather, whom he knew, was a man of mighty characteristics businessman, entrepreneur, 
once known as the King of Wall Street, part owner of the New York Times, and a pioneer of horse racing in the United States, after whom Jerome Park is named. Leonard Jerome was active on behalf of the Union and financed the warship Meteor in the Civil War. Churchill was proud of the fact that three of his American ancestors fought on the American side in the War of Independence. And for Churchill, the Declaration of Independence was an admired part of his own heritage. He was proud, too, that on his family tree, George Washington appears. As Churchill told a joint session of Congress in 1942, I like to feel that if my mother had been English and my father American and not the other way round, I might have got here on my own. Churchill was very proud of his American ancestry. In 1952 at the White House, there was rather a difficult discussion about which type of rifle should be used by the two armies, the British and American armies. Should they standardize and have a single rifle? And the senior British general present, Field Marshal Slim, said rather testily, because he didn't want to have the same rifle as the Americans, I suppose we could experiment with a bastard rifle, partly American, partly British, at which Churchill said, kindly moderate your language, Field Marshal. It may be recalled that I myself am partly American, partly British. <laughs> Churchill was always interested in things American. When he was 12 years old, he had to fight a very long battle with his mother to persuade her to persuade his teachers to let him go to London, ostensibly because it was Queen Victoria's Jubilee. But as he said to his mother, you mustn't mention to my teachers the real reason why you are insisting that I leave school. And that was because he wanted to see Buffalo Bill Cody's great exhibition at the Earl's Court. <laughs> uh, and in his uh, papers, together with the letters to his mother, including the draft letter for her to write to the teachers, is the advertisement from the Times newspaper. Grandstand for 20,000 people. Bands of Sioux, Arapahoes, Shoshone, Cheyenne, and other Indians. Cowboys, scouts, and Mexican vaqueros. Riding, shooting, lassoing, hunting. St attacks on stagecoaches, an attack on a settler's cabin as well as frontier girl riders and cowboy bands. These Indians, whom Churchill was so excited to see at the Earl's Court, were not a distant curiosity to him. American Indian blood flowed in his veins, and he was proud of it. As he told one of his doctors in 1960, I am descended from a Seneca Indian squaw, who was an ancestor of my mother. Churchill was indeed one sixty-fourth Native American, thus even more Native American than your president, Dr. Arne, who is merely one two hundred and fifty-sixth. The second thing that America meant to Churchill was the great struggle here, the Civil War. From his earliest days, Churchill was an avid student of the American Civil War. As a six-year-old schoolboy, he was reading the back numbers of the British magazine Punch with its powerful political cartoons. And here is what he recalled when he came to the Civil War period of the magazine. And he was then a schoolboy in a boarding school at the age of six where he was often quite savagely beaten 
by the headmaster, as were many of the other boys. And he recalled, first of all, Mr. Punch was against the South. And we had a picture of a fierce young woman, Miss Carolina, about to whip a naked slave with a, count, with a kind of scourge, which not being myself yet removed from the zone of such possibilities, I regarded as undoubtedly severe. I was all for the slave. I remember also a cartoon showing a whole regiment of Yankees running away from a place called Bull Run. A cartoon of North and South as two savage, haggard men in shirts and breeches grappling and stabbing each other with knives as they reeled into an abyss marked bankruptcy. And finally, I remember a drawing of Lincoln's tomb and Britannia, very sad, laying a wreath on the cold marble. When Churchill was 12 at another better school, one of his father's friends came down to talk to the boys. Colonel Guro, who had fought at Gessiburg and came in his uniform. A voracious reader, for his 13th birthday, the book Churchill asked his mother for was Grant's illustrated history of the Civil War. And it's interesting to note that in 1896, when he was 21, he read a just published book on the Civil War, which he recommended to all his American friends, none of whom had yet read it. The book was Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of Courage. The third thing that the United States meant to Churchill was the actual place, the personality of the American people. He first came here in 1895 as a young soldier on his way to Cuba as the guest of the Spanish military who were then seeking in vain to crush the Cuban insurgency. And he was so excited by New York and by the Americans whom he met that he prolonged his visit there for as long as he could. As he wrote to his younger brother, Jack, picture yourself to yourself, the American people, as a great lusty youth who treads on all your sensibilities, perpetrates every possible horror of ill manners, whom neither age nor tradition inspire with reverence, but who moves about his affairs with a good-hearted freshness which may well be the envy of the older nations of the earth. One of his mother's sisters, his American Aunt Leonie, was another of those to whom he wrote from New York. And he tried to reflect on the meaning of what he was seeing. I think, he wrote to his aunt, that the method of communication in New York has struck me the most. The comfort and convenience of the elevated railways, tramways, cable cars, and ferries, harmoniously fitted into a perfect system, accessible alike to the richest and poorest. It is extraordinary. When one reflects that such benefits have been secured to the people, not by confiscation of the property of the rich or by arbitrary taxation, but simply by business enterprise, out of which the promoters have themselves made colossal fortunes, one cannot but fail to be impressed with excellence of the capitalist system. There was one problem. In England in 1896, you paid for your tram ride or your bus ride, your horse bus ride, with a little coin, a copper or a silver or a gold coin. And everybody carried their little pouch of coins. Paper money was something you associated with primitive revolutionary governments with no financial stability. <laughs> 
And so he wrote to his mother, I paid my fare across Brooklyn Bridge with a paper dollar. I th should think that is the most disreputable coin the world has ever seen. I wondered how to reconcile the magnificent system of communication with the abominable currency. I think I have found what may be the solution. The communication of New York is due to private enterprise, while the state is responsible for the currency. <laughs> Hence, I come to the conclusion that the first-class men of America are running the counting houses, and the less brilliant ones, the government. <laughs> the fourth thing that the United States meant to Churchill was something which he read in a book by Henry Demarest Lloyd, which was the great attack at the turn of the century on monopoly capitalism. And Churchill was so struck by this book, and I can recommend it, it's the most extraordinary attack on the power of the oil companies, the monopoly power of the oil companies of those days, that he wove it into his political philosophy into his conservative, capitalist, political philosophy. And on his 25th birthday, when he happened, I hope it doesn't happen to any of you here, it happened that he was in a prisoner of war camp in South Africa, a captive. Uh, he had time to write a long letter to his closest American friend in which he expanded on his views derived from Lloyd's book. Merchant princes, he wrote, are all very well, but if I have anything to say to it, their kingdom shall not be of this world. The new century will witness the great war for the existence of the individual. Up to a certain point, I agree that combination has brought us nothing but good, but we seem to have reached a period when it threatens nothing but evil. Poor but independent is worth something as a motto. And he was to spend a lot of his political life in England challenging the power of monopolies and trying to make sure that the individual, the well-being of the individual, the potential of the individual was not blotted out by monopoly capitalism. The fifth thing that the United States was to Churchill was a source of income. From his very first lecture tour in 1901, when he was only 26, he earned astonishing figures from his lectures and was able by his lectures in the United States to afford a good lifestyle in Britain, to bring up his family, to buy a fine house, to furnish fine houses. He began lecturing about his experiences in the war in South Africa, about his capture, about his imprisonment, and about his dramatic escape. And what endeared him to the American audiences, whose sympathies were for the Boers in South Africa against whom Britain was fighting, what endeared him to his audiences was his tremendous sympathy for the enemy, for the beaten enemy. And he used to show, he did his lectures with slides, it was a slideshow lecture, and he would show these Boer fighters and he would say, this is a brave man, this is a man whom I admire. And when he said that in the House of Commons on his return from the United States lecture tour, having just been elected to Parliament, most of his colleagues thought he was mad. You can't get up in the British House of Commons. And he said, if I were a Boer, I would be fighting in the field. And they didn't understand it, but he'd been fighting against them. They were the enemy. What didn't go down well in the House of Commons went down well here in the United States. And in all his speeches here, in 1901, again in 1931, in his next great lecture tour, he 
he spoke of his pride in his American mother. In England, when people wanted to criticize him, they said, well, of course, Winston is half alien and wholly reprehensible. Uh, in one of his very first lectures in 1901 in Boston under the auspices of what was called the Anglo-American Society so there was a stars and stripes and a union flag on the platform he said there is no one in this room who has a greater respect for the stars and stripes than the humble individual to whom you of the city which gave birth to the idea of a tea party have so kindly listened. I am proud of the fact that I am the natural product of an Anglo-American alliance, not political, but stronger and more sacred, an alliance of heart to heart. The sixth point which I thought was an aspect of what the United States meant to Churchill, and a very important aspect, which might seem odd today. The United States to him meant a country with which Britain should not go to war. When Churchill was first over here in 1895, Britain and the United States were deep in a vicious quarrel over the boundary of Venezuela and British Guiana. And Churchill believed, from the letters he received from his army friends, that once he returned to Britain, he would have to immediately return to Canada to join a British force gathering there to prepare for war with the United States. And he brooded over this extraordinary incident, now forgotten, but then very much in the headlines and stirring passions. And in his very first speech in the House of Commons, his maiden speech, the first of so many thousands that were to follow, he referred to what had happened in 1895 and 1896. And he said, evil would be the day, dark would be the counselors, when we embarked on that most foolish futile and fatal of all wars, a war with the United States. And curiously, the only agreement he ever signed as Prime Minister with the United States, which was in the form of an alliance, was the secret agreement which he signed in 1942 that Britain and the United States would never use the atomic weapon against each other. There was a moment as a young parliamentarian, my seventh perspective, when the United States meant to Churchill a possible bride. He loved the theater. Even in the midst of heavy parliamentary duties, he would always find time to go to the theater and almost always went to the first night of every play. I don't think there was a play in London before World War I that he had not seen and even after World War I he always went to the theater. And in 1902 there was on the stage in London a beautiful American actress five years younger than he just the right age difference, Ethel Barrymore. And he fell for her completely. So much so, and he knew she was staying at Claridge's Hotel, that every night he would go to Claridge's Hotel and sit in the restaurant there alone, hoping that Miss Barrymore would make an appearance. He was always a shy man, and as you can imagine, Ethel Barrymore was surrounded by a lot of admirers. And when he came over here in the 30s, he told a number of friends, you know, I wish I'd had the courage to be more forceful with her. 
had managed to propose to her. And she turned him down. And many years later, she told Churchill's son, Randolph, I was much attracted to your papa, but felt that I would not be able to cope with the great world of politics. The United States also meant for Churchill a source of flying expertise. Churchill, who learned to fly as a young man, was a great believer in the future of flight as an instrument of war. And in 1909, when he entered the Committee of Imperial Defense, the central defense policy body of the British cabinet, 34 years old, by far the most junior member of this august body, he urged his colleagues to make immediate contact with the Wright brothers in the United States in order that Britain could be at the cutting edge of the new science of aviation. As he told the committee, the problem of the use of airplanes was such an important one, we must place ourselves in communication with Mr. Wright and avail ourselves of his knowledge. Not for the first time his advice was turned down. When war came in Europe in 1914, Churchill held the senior position of First Lord of the Admiralty in charge of Britain's Navy and also a member of the War Council, the inner war body. And from the moment that war broke out, the United States became for him a source of vital war material, without which Britain could not carry on totally effective war. Submarine warfare was in its infancy, but the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians, our principal adversaries, had good submarines and good submariners. And Britain was very short. And so he entered into an agreement with a very remarkable American, Charles Schwab, the head of Bethlehem Steel in Pennsylvania, who had come over to Britain at the beginning of the war. Incidentally, he'd been interned upon arrival because the ship on which he was coming to Britain, an ordinary ocean liner, the Olympic, had witnessed the sinking of a British warship, the Audacious. And it was deemed prudent that no one who saw the sinking should be allowed to wander about town because they might pass this knowledge, which was being kept secret, to the newspapers. Anyway, finally Schwab managed to persuade his captors, the British policemen, that he had an appointment with the First Lord of the Admiralty in London, and under police guard, they let him go. And Schwab explained to Churchill that he could not provide submarines for the British Navy because of the American Neutrality Acts forbidding the transfer of war material to a belligerent. And so the two men cooked up a device, whereas Schwab manufactured the submarines but didn't rivet them together, uh, <laughs> sent them up by train from Pennsylvania to Montreal, Canada. Uh, it was quite permissible to send large slabs of curved steel and box boxes of rivets. And there in Montreal they were assembled, and so they were known as the Montreal boats. And Churchill later wrote, when explaining to someone why he wanted to have dinner with Schwab in the United States in 1932, we got on so very well then and settled everything on the dead level quite easily in an hour or two. He risked his life to carry out his contract. And not only did Schwab build these submarines for Britain, but he did something the United States was to do again in 1917 and again in World War II. He massively increased the uh, speed with which these vessels were, were built reducing it from two and a half years to six months.
Another thing that Schwab did, which convinced Churchill that the United States would always be a source of essential war materials for Britain, he said, and Churchill was very short of naval guns, these great 15-inch guns, two of which you can see outside the Imperial War Museum in London, massive weapons. He said, we can't sell you these guns, and of course, the gun once made is a gun. We can't pretend it's something else. But he said, we have manufactured some of these for some foreign governments. Therefore, in a sense, they are already not ours. So why don't you just take them? And all it meant was that the Greeks or the Turks didn't get their guns. <laughs> the United States also meant for Churchill, this is my tenth point, a universal patriotism. He was very struck in World War I at the large number of Americans, I believe the total number was 26,000, who while the United States was still neutral in 1914, 15, and 16, volunteered to fight in the armies of the existing allies, the British, the French, and the Italians. And when Churchill himself, thrown out of politics and out of government, went to the Western Front and commanded a battalion in the trenches, he met one of these Americans, a young lieutenant called Harvey Butters, who had fought in some of the worst battles of 1915, including the Battle of Luz. And at first, Churchill thought from his accent, uh, sometimes we stupid English people do, that he must be Canadian. And he said, ah, Canada, to which Butters answered, a little south of it, sir, San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> uh. A year after they met and became friends, Butters was killed in action on the Battle of the Somme. And Churchill wrote his obituary in the London Observer newspaper. I was charmed by his extraordinary fund of wit and gaiety. His conversation was delightful, full at once of fun and good sense. He did not come all the way from San Francisco, only out of affection for the ancient home of his forebears, or in a spirit of new adventure. He was in sentiment a thorough American, but he had a very clear and firm conception of the issues which are at stake in this struggle. And then in 1917, the United States joined that struggle. And Churchill too returned from the trenches, his fortunes restored, his political fortunes, and became Minister of Munitions of War, responsible for providing the munitions necessary to continue to fight the war. And my eleventh point of what the United States meant to Churchill is the United States meant a fine ally, a fine and indispensable ally. There was great anguish in Britain and anger and anti-Americanism at the long delay in the United States entering World War I. Churchill did not share that anger and in his history of the First World War called the World Crisis, he was at great pains to explain to his British readers what American sentiment was. And again used that phrase that if my mother had been English and my father had been an American, but in this context, I might have held those views as well, that we should not enter the European conflict. And in one of his finest pieces of writing, he describes the moment when the United States finally resolved to go to war against Germany in April 1917. And he writes, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, the call was answered and obeyed. 
iron laws of compulsory service, reinforced by social pressures of mutual discipline, in which the great majority of the population took part, asserted an instantaneous unity of opinion. Pacifism, indifference, dissent were swept from the path, and with a roar of slowly gathered pent-up wrath, which overpowered in its din every discordant yell, the American nation sprang to arms. Suddenly a nation of 120 million unfurls her standard on what is already the stronger side, suddenly the most numerous democracy in the world, long posing as a judge, is hurled, nay hurls itself, into the conflict. There was resentment in Britain at the so-called late arrival of the American troops. And some fairly unpleasant songs used to be sung when American soldiers disembarked at Liverpool or Southampton or in France. Onward, Yankee soldiers, onward as to war. You would not be fighting had you come before, etc. <laughs> but Churchill again combated this. And when he spoke and wrote, he said that we must be pleased and proud that the Americans have come in. They are our cousins, he wrote, our brothers, the great republic of the United States. And then, as Minister of Munitions, he saw many of these American soldiers going into action. And on the 4th of July, 1918, at a large Anglo-American gathering in London, just after he'd returned from a visit to the Western Front, he said, when I have seen during the past few weeks the splendor of American manhood striding forward on all the roads of France and Flanders, I've experienced emotions which words cannot describe. The only recompense Britain seeks from the American people is the supreme reconciliation of Britain and the United States. If our two armies and two nations work well together to secure the victory, Britain and the United States may yet act permanently together. As Minister of Munitions, Churchill presided for a year and a half over the Inter-Allied Munitions Council. And every aspect of American war needs and American war production went through his hands. He had to provide the raw materials for many of America's weapons. He established an Anglo-American tank factory in France and made himself responsible for the production of aircraft, tanks, and guns for the United States. And he was excited, as he was to be in World War II, by the way in which he was able to work so well with the individual Americans with whom he dealt. Edward Stettinius, the father of the future Secretary of State, Admiral Sims, Bernard Baruch, the supremos of American munitions manufacture. As he wrote, we carried on the war in common in every sense of the expression. We transferred masses of every kind of material in every stage of production from one ledger to another in accordance with our very different needs as easily as two friends might share a luncheon basket. We ransacked our cupboards to find anything the American troops in France required. And the Americans, once the case was clearly explained to them, drew without hesitation from their own remoter programs for our more urgent needs. There then came the most difficult moment for Churchill, when the United States didn't mean a great ally, a great source of the means of Britain's survival, a great people, but meant a bitter disappointment. Churchill had been buoyed up, as had so many in Europe, by your president, Woodrow Wilson's extraordinary idea of a League of Nations 
which would be all the nations of the world, creating a security system so that anyone who tried to attack his neighbor would have all the other members of the League of Nations against him. Wilson put a tremendous effort into making this League of Nations and its security system an impressive and powerful one. And then, as you know, the United States Senate voted against the whole project. And the United States didn't withdraw from the League of Nations and its security pacts because it never joined them. And for the rest of his life, this rankled with Churchill, really rankled. He tried, even while the Senate was debating the issue, to influence American opinion. A more melancholy page in human history, he wrote, in one of the main British papers, can hardly be conceived than the United States turning its back on the security of Europe. I cannot believe that will be written by American hands. And he pleaded that what he called the two great branches of the English-speaking people must work together to secure global security. Having saved Europe together from the hands of the spoiler, I have the sure conviction that by acting together now, we can safeguard ourselves from every peril which the future may have in store. His bitterness was so great that when in 1925, 1926, he was writing in his war books about the terrible slaughter on the Western Front in 1915, he warned that these slaughters would return now that the United States had withdrawn from this great American project for collective security. And in 1937, as war clouds gathered in Europe, he wrote to one of his closest American friends, how you must regret, how we all regret, that Wilson's dream was not carried through. For I have no doubt it would have made the difference between a safe, happy, prosperous world and the present hideous panorama. And when he came to speak to Congress in 1942, and his speech began on such a high note and there's such excitement among the congressmen, the senators, and you sense it on the film of it, and he felt he had to refer to this. He felt it would not be honest for him not to tell the congressmen and senators that he would not be standing there, in his view, as war leader, and they would not be listening to him having entered the war a fortnight earlier if they had not withdrawn. They, the very same senators, had not withdrawn from the League of Nations and thrown aside the chance of leading the collective security of the world. But the next point, the next thirteenth point, which the United States meant to Churchill, was exactly that this sense of grievance and any difference between the United States, and there were to be many on many issues, should not be allowed to interfere with the basic unity and common purpose of the two peoples. At the height of this bitter debate following America's withdrawal, Churchill was elected president of the English-speaking Union and he had to give the presidential address. And he wrote to his wife, it was uphill work to make an enthusiastic speech about the United States. All the same, there is only one road for us to tread, and that is to keep as friendly with them as possible, to be overwhelmingly patient and to wait for the growth of better feelings, which will certainly come. The fourteenth thing in my little calendar that the United States meant to Churchill 
was a wonderful place to visit. He came here in 1929 and for two months traveled by train and car from Seattle to LA, to the Grand Canyon, to Chicago, to Washington, and to the battlefields of Virginia. And he was absolutely entranced by what he saw. And then, reflecting on the United States not having come into the war in 1914, and reflecting on the withdrawal from the League of Nations, he wrote a charming article in the What If series of writing, which I can strongly recommend to exercise your brains if, uh, if you ever feel they're not being exercised. Choose a What If theme. And his What If theme was what if there had been a different evolution of Anglo-American relations after the American Civil War? culminating not in the near war of 1895, which had so alarmed him at the time, but culminating, as he describes it, in the signature on Christmas Day, 1905, of what he called the Covenant of the English-Speaking Association. The essence of this association was common citizenship of Britain and the United States. As he wrote, hundreds of millions of people suddenly adopted a new point of view without prejudice to their existing loyalties and sentiments. They gave birth in themselves to a new higher loyalty and wider sentiment. And this English-speaking association was so powerful, Britain and America together, that it prevented the coming of war in 1914 by persuading the Europeans to form a united states of Europe. So Britain and America created the common market and two world wars were avoided. Churchill returned to the United States in 1931. His last visit before World War II. And once again the United States was a source of great income to him and great income in extraordinary circumstances. He started his lecture tour in Worcester, Massachusetts. He was to go to some 35 cities, entirely traveling by train at night, speaking in the day, and then on by night to the next place. But returning to New York from Massachusetts, he went to see a friend, had not at that time been an Englishman ever seen a traffic light before, made an awful hash of crossing Fifth Avenue and was knocked down by a car. Knocked down flat, squashed, very seriously injured. So much so that his family, who hurried to be with him, didn't think he could ever again, let alone lecture, return to politics. And somehow or other, he made an astonishing recovery. He had a little relapse. He recovered again, and then he went on with his lecture tour. And once again, his theme was unity. Let our common tongue, our common basic law, our joint heritage of literature and ideals, the red tie of kinship, become the sponge of obliteration of all the unpleasantness of the past the sponge of obliteration of all the unpleasantness of the past. Churchill had been in New York on the day of the great crash. Indeed, one desperate investor had committed suicide by throwing himself out of the window of the hotel in which Churchill was staying, a higher window. And he had gone to the stock exchange to see the pandemonium on that day. And my 16th, what did the United States mean to Winston Churchill, is it meant a land so powerful in its natural resources and so powerful in its human resources that it would recover. That the great crash, which at the time seemed such a desperate thing and was so desperate, 
was a passing phase. His first article after the Great Crash, in which he was describing why America could never go down, it could fall but it could never collapse, he wrote, this is the country of mass production of standardized articles by and for the people under capitalist guidance, the foundation of a sound economic system. And he showed his confidence by buying substantial blocks of American stocks and shares. A year later, when the markets were still rather wobbly, he wrote to his chief financial advisor in Los Angeles, there is not much oh boy about the markets lately, but my faith in the United States recovery is unshakable. And then, as war clouds gathered in Europe, Churchill saw the United States as the essential English-speaking partner for Britain, with or without an alliance. And he fought hard against the strong anti-American sentiment in British political circles. A low point for Churchill was when the United States government offered to host a conference of all the European disputants at the end of 1937 to try to get some settlement. And Churchill was excited because this was in a way turning, America turning its back on what the Senate had done in 1920. At last the United States was willing and urging that it should be part of the discussion. And to Churchill's distress, Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, in one of his very first acts as Prime Minister, turned down the American offer. Churchill certainly had a sense that this Anglo-American unity would come to pass. He believed that unless it came to pass, Britain's future would be desperate. A parlor game used to be played in his country house in Chequers at weekends. Rather a fun thing, you can do it yourself around your family circle. When everybody around the table, after a good dinner, has to say what they would like to be or do. If they had all the power in the world, what would they want to be or do? And the game went round the table, and one of the people present was Roosevelt's son, James. Roosevelt had just been elected president. And everybody said they wanted to make a million, and they wanted to spend the summer on a beach, or whatever it was they hoped to do. And when the turn came for Churchill to speak, he said, I wish to be Prime Minister in close and daily communication by telephone with the President of the United States. There is nothing we could not do if we were together. And he believed that. When war came in 1939, the United States meant something else to Churchill. It meant the one source of averting defeat. And Churchill's first year as Prime Minister was spent desperately and with great difficulty, but eventually with success, in persuading the United States administration to make the crucial commitments to enable Britain to remain at war. And the United States did this. And the culmination of America's contribution was the Lend-Lease Act, which essentially meant that Britain could acquire from the United States any weapons of war that she needed without worrying about immediate payment. Churchill called Lend-Lease the most unsordid act in the history of any nation. And seven years after the war, talking about Lend-Lease to Congress, which then was putting the screws on Britain for repayment. And on the 31st of December this year, I shall lift a glass of champagne and drink it 
to the fact that finally, on the 31st of December 2005, Britain will no longer owe the United States one penny for either the First or Second World Wars. <laughs> we'll have paid the debt. <laughs> but even when Churchill was struggling to get that debt, struggling in vain to get that debt reduced, he said to Congress, Lend-Lease will never be forgotten by this generation in Britain or by history. The next thing that the United States meant to Churchill, even before America entered the war in December 1941, was that she was the undefeatable nation. And that is why he believed that there was no way that Hitler or Mussolini or Hirohito could be victorious. And in 1941, in April, when the Japanese were beginning to look as if they were going to turn, as they did in December, against Britain and the United States simultaneously at Pearl Harbor and Malaya, Churchill wrote a letter to the Japanese foreign minister in which he pointed out to him why the United States could never be defeated. And in his letter he said, of course, you can maul them, you can bloody them, but you can't defeat them. And he asked the Japanese foreign minister a number of questions. And he made you two of them. And he told the Japanese foreign minister, you answer these questions correctly and you will leave well alone. Will the German attack, he asked, on British shipping, be strong enough to prevent American aid from reaching British shores, with Great Britain and the United States transforming their whole industry to war purpose? Did Japan's accession to the German-Italian axis make it more likely or less likely that the United States would eventually enter the present war? If the United States entered the war on the side of Great Britain, and if Japan ranged herself with Germany and Italy, would not the naval superiority of the two English-speaking nations enable them to dispose of Germany and Italy in Europe and then to turn their united power against Japan? And finally, a wonderful question. Is it true, Your Excellency, that the production of steel in the United States this year will be 75 million tons, and in Great Britain about 12 and a half million tons, making a total of nearly 90 million tons. If Germany should happen to be defeated, as she was last time, will not the 7 million ton steel production of Japan be inadequate for a prolonged war? And then came Pearl Harbor and the German declaration of war on the United States. And many people in Britain felt that America simply hadn't got the guts to play a real part in this war. And Churchill took a counter opinion. As he wrote, silly people, and there were many not only in enemy countries, discounted the force of the United States. Some said they were soft. Others that they would never be united. They would fool around at a distance. They would never come to grips. They would never stand bloodletting. Their democracy and system of recurrent elections would paralyze their war effort. They would be just a vague blur on the horizon to friend and foe. Now we should see the weakness of this numerous, but remote, wealthy, and talkative people. But I had studied the American Civil War, fought out to the last desperate inch. American blood flowed in my veins. I thought of a remark which the British Foreign Secretary, Edward Gray, had made to me more than 30 years before that the United States is like a gigantic boiler. Once the fire is lighted under it, there is no limit to the power it can generate.
And so the United States became the ally with whom to win the war. And Churchill had tremendous confidence, despite the many strategic disagreements, despite the many conflicts of personalities. He had supreme confidence that they would remain together and that they would win the war. And whenever he discovered in his administration some senior civil servant or general or air marshal or admiral making disparaging remarks about some aspect of American fighting ability or American productivity or American willingness to, to suffer, that person got a very severe rebuke and in some cases was removed from his post. So close was the system which Churchill worked hard to create that as the Normandy landings were being planned and Churchill would ask to see the person in charge of some particular branch of the planning, he never knew until that person came to his room in Downing Street whether it would be a British officer or an American officer. So interwoven was the structure. My 22nd, what did the United States mean to Winston Churchill, is the partner in a lasting union. And in a way, when we talk today of the special relationship of Bush and Blair, we're talking about something that Churchill set out in his great Albert Hall speech on Thanksgiving Day, 1944, November the 23rd, 1944. And he said, the future Thanksgiving Day will be when the union of action which has been forced upon us by our common hatred of tyranny shall become a lasting union of sympathy and good feeling and loyalty and hope between all the British and American peoples wherever they may dwell. Then indeed there will be a day of Thanksgiving and one in which the world will share. The 23rd thing that the United States was to Britain, and Britons of my generation feel this very strongly, the United States, after 1945, was the generous giver. The Marshall Plan, which wasn't a handout, it was an attempt by the United States to get the European countries and Britain to revive and stimulate and put in order their economies. The Marshall Plan was an extraordinary act by the United States, which undoubtedly saved much of Western Europe from going into ruin and poverty, and indeed into communism. And Churchill was very excited after the Marshall Plan was announced to get a letter from George Marshall saying that the origin of the plan was a remark Churchill had made a year earlier in a speech he made in Zurich, where he had said that the ideal should be a United States of Europe in which mighty America would be the friend and sponsor. And Churchill was very proud of Marshall's endorsement. My penultimate meaning for Churchill of the United States was the defender of freedom in time of peace. Churchill had worked very closely with Truman from the last days of the war. And Churchill had urged Truman to undertake the responsibilities which Woodrow Wilson had been unable to persuade Congress to undertake and to do it in such a way that Congress need not be involved. And the crisis came when Britain, which had commitments to defend Greece and Turkey from communist incursion, when Labour Britain withdrew from that commitment, a terrible day in our history, the 3rd of February 1947, when the Attlee government simply pulled the rug from under its commitment. And within a week, President Truman had stepped in to that breach and introduced a bill which became the 
what we know as the Truman Doctrine. And Churchill wrote to Truman, I cannot resist writing to tell you how much I admire what you have done for the peace and freedom of the world. And finally, I believe that the United States meant to Churchill in the last two decades of his life and projecting forward into the future, it meant the essential ally. When Churchill was in Washington in June 1954, he and Eisenhower signed a document which I've never seen referred to in the history books or on display in the museums. It wasn't in the uh, Library of Congress Churchill exhibition that it ought to have been. And that was an Anglo-American Declaration of Principles, 27th of June, 1954, in which Britain and the United States affirmed their comradeship, offered the hand of friendship to all who might seek it sincerely, reasserted their sympathy for and loyalty to all those still in bondage, proclaimed their desire to reduce armaments and turn nuclear power into peaceful channels, and proclaimed their determination to develop and maintain, I quote, the spiritual, economic, and military strength necessary to have peace and dignity in the world. These were all principles, Churchill told the House of Commons, which we share with our American friends. There were to be rough moments ahead, even while Eisenhower was still president. Churchill's successor, Anthony Eden, embarked upon the Suez War with France and Israel, and the United States forced Britain to withdraw, made horrific threats against us, against our economy. And Churchill, although he was out of politics, returned to the House of Commons to urge again members of Parliament not to vent their anger upon the United States. And he used an extraordinary phrase. He said, we must struggle on, still looking to the union with America. I'd like to end with his final words to his cabinet. When at the age of 80, he finally retired from British politics. And he gathered his cabinet together and he said, I want to give you two pieces of advice. One is, do not regard the peoples you govern and rule and are responsible for as mechanical things. Man is spirit. And the second thing he said was, never be separated from the Americans. Thank you.